Hey, hey, everybody. If you're listening to this, you are listening to the first free hour of this episode of The Shift with Doug McKenty. If you like what you're hearing, please consider subscribing to the show in order to access the full feature-length versions of the podcast, as well as have access to the members' forum, where we discuss potential topics and interviews and dive deep into the overall concept of The Shift. For only six bucks a month, not only do you get the full-length episodes, but also an opportunity to co-create with me, your host, Doug McKenty, the future of the show. Go to www.theshiftnow.com or patreon.com backslash the shift and sign up today in order to help make the shift possible. Thanks for listening and enjoy the show. Good morning, noon, or night, wherever and whenever you are listening, you are listening to The Shift. I'm your host. My name is Doug McKenty. This episode was recorded on May 5th, 2022. Today, I'm happy to announce this interview with journalist and blogger Nikki Reed. Nikki is an openly transgender writer whose queer identity imbues her perspective on politics with a uniqueness rarely seen within the vast context of the blogosphere. Though decidedly left-leaning, Nikki blends a voluntarist libertarian ethos with more traditional left-wing talking points to create a brand of left populism as unique as her own personal sexual identity. This conversation will include a nuanced discussion concerning identity politics that both admires its plea for tolerance while castigating its lack of real authenticity. In her essay, Don't Say Gov, What Queer Kids Need Now is Anarchy, Nikki advocates for the destruction of one-size-fits-all education systems, while promoting the idea that the queer community can develop its own parallel systems designed to aid gender-fluid adolescents, seeking to transition into a community more suited to their particular lifestyle choices. In her view, rather than assimilating alternative groups into the larger centralized power structure characteristic of Western imperialism, the solution lies in decentralizing power into the hands of minority communities fully capable of moving forward within the context of a spirit of self-determination. While initially inspired by Latin American Marxist movements attempting to overthrow the centuries-long yoke of colonization, the realization that all centralized power structures eventually devolve into corruption caused Nikki to advocate for non-aligned movements outside the typical left-right divide. Her essay, Together We Are Tito, harkens back to the leadership of Yugoslavian President Marshal Joseph Broz Tito, whose insistence on the decentralization of power caused a break with Soviet Russia and the ultimate creation of the non-aligned movement which advocated for neutrality during the so-called Cold War. Nikki's work invites the reader to reconsider this perspective in favor of advocacy for decentralization across the board. For Nikki, Communities empowered to determine their own path forward will create solutions caused by the larger forces of centralized control inherent in exploitative and imperialistic systems characteristic of both capitalism and communism alike. Ultimately, not only does Nikki offer a political philosophy attractive to all who identify with the populist label, but her genderqueer identity provides an authenticity derived from real-life experience. Stay tuned for an interview that will include both a practical understanding of the pros and cons of the current identity politics craze, as well as political analysis from an anti-imperialist perspective that encapsulates geopolitical interpretations from a left populist point of view. You can find the work of Nikki Reed at Counterpunch at www.attackthesystem.com or on her personal blog at www.exileinhappyvalley.blogspot.com. As always, please like, subscribe, and share this interview with all your favorite social media platforms. We rely on listeners like you for the distribution of this alternative information. To discover more about The Shift, find hours of free content, sign up for the newsletter, or subscribe for feature-length versions of each episode, go to www.theshiftnow.com. Become part of the conversation by searching for Doug McKenty on Facebook or at McKenty on Twitter. Without further ado, I'd like to thank journalist Nikki Reed for agreeing to this interview, and thank you for helping to make the shift. Hey, everybody, and welcome to this 120th episode of The Shift. I'm your host, Doug McKenty. I am pleased to be joined today by journalist uh, Nikki Reed. She is a writer for Counterpunch. 
uh, assistant editor at Attack the System and um, has her own blog at Exile in Happy Valley. Um, she um, describes herself as a, as a, how would you describe yourself, Nikki? <laughs> it changes day by day, but uh, sure. I gener generally go with gender fuck anarchist. Sounds good. That seems to offend the most people. Right. <laughs> quality, so I have to go for that. I've been really happy uh, in reading your stuff because of what I've been trying to do with this show for the longest time is figure out how to kind of, it, it just became really clear for me. I mean, probably 20 years ago, 15 years ago that the left, right paradigm was this way to divide and conquer people that the upper classes just were able to, to take this left, right divide and get the people to fight with each other all the time um, and never come together. Uh, you know, because if we came together, then we'd actually be a threat to these guys. Um, and it seems like you've come, I, I, as the people that have watched this show know, you know, I pretty much describe myself as more of a voluntarist. I mean, I think you do too, actually, these days, but I come yeah. from this, this libertarian perspective, this really free market oriented perspective that has evolved over time um, into this really kind of left libertarian, you know, philosophy i think that's that's fairly unique but then in reading your stuff it seems like you actually started probably as this you know radical queer marxist and found yourself evolving more into this uh i sort of left libertarian place too i guess um i mean even in reading your stuff i i like the history that you know is different than than mine and your influences although a lot of your influences are similar to mine as well but then when I'm reading your stuff, it's just like it clicks for me. I agree with everything that you say. So I'll let you take it away from there. But um, yeah, just try to just try to describe yourself. Uh, my background is um, is a bit unusual. Um, both my parents, my mother in particular, is a very conservative Catholic. Uh -huh. I grew up in a very conservative Catholic small town community. Just a bit stifling for somebody who's an individual of any kind. Um, I kind of, the, the dawning of my, my uh, political evolution was, uh, was the war in Iraq. Um, I was, I believe, 14 at the time. And I, I, before that, I had basically kind of just accepted all of the company line Republican bullshit. Um, but it, it didn't seem like I had to scratch very hard to smell the bullshit when it came to Iraq. Yeah, that's for sure. I was very disturbed by the lack of other people being disturbed by the fact that this thing was obviously bogus that you know we i nine the afghanistan made some degree of sense to me at the time you know but to go from 9 11 to saddam hussein just did, did not compute yeah and i remember i remember the night that we uh launched shock and awe i remember actually watching the bombs going off in baghdad I remember just thinking, um, people are dying, but he fucking cares. Um, so it started for me just as anti imperialism. Um, I began, I kind of came to the conclusion after reading, um, I don't even know how I found came across this, but I found a copy of What Uncle Sam Really Wants by Noam Chomsky in which he very, in very explicit detail, kind of makes the case that uh, the United States is the new Nazi Germany. And he does this by explaining our foreign policy in Central America, particularly during the 1980s, which was as atrocious as it gets. We got our hands dirty in every kind of, of war crime imaginable. Uh, every you know, killing children, use of rape, uh, massacring whole villages, genocide, and you know, the works. And I basically came to the conclusion that um, America has to be stopped. 
Uh, and, you know, at first I, I flirted a little bit with anarchism, um, kind of sex pistol style, kind of fucking everything, anarchism, not real serious anarchism. Mm. Uh, and then eventually I, I uh, kind of became enamored with uh, Hugo Chavez and the whole Bolivarian evolution. Um, I was more inspired by Latin American Marxism by Castro, Che Guevara, than I was by anything Russian. Um, but I, I kind of essentially found myself uh, becoming what is typically known as a tanky. Uh, yeah, basically, whoever the other guy was, I was for whoever the other guy was. Um, and, you know, if that's Vladimir Putin, then it's Vladimir Putin. You know, and I kind of came to this conclusion that whoever is going to defeat America is on that that's the right side. Um, I'm not sure when I discovered that that was ridiculous. Um, I think it was after when Hugo Chavez died and uh, Maduro was an absolute mess. And uh, I get the feeling that Chavez was something of a benevolent dictator, uh, even though he was democratically elected. But, you know, that's if you buy into democracy being democracy. Right. But Maduro was very clearly, um, he was very cl clearly not Chavez. And it, it kind of became clear to me that any regime was basically just one death away from being a dictatorship and that, that kind of that kind of shattered my illusions that there were good sides and bad sides in terms of politics um and then i i, I got very involved on the boards on antiwar.com um I was a very big fan of justin Ramondo, even though he was a hardcore paleoconservative he was probably the best person in some American foreign policy, uh, regardless of which perspective you came from. And on those message boards, I increasingly came into contact with a, a lot of libertarians. Um, and I began kind of um, reading up. And it, it became harder and harder for me to deny the uh the moral logic of voluntarism right um in this idea that you shouldn't force people to do anything that 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 made sense to me um and i kind of basically came to the conclusion you know i i, I have the same goals generally in egalitarian society, you know, equality, things like that. Um, but I came to the conclusion that if you don't come from a voluntary standpoint, if you don't come from the bottom up, it always ends up getting polluted. Um, and I kind of came to the conclusion that, you know, my goal was, um, to destroy America. Um, but I, I came to the conclusion that, that voluntarism was a, was a better weapon for that. Uh, the uh, people's stick, as they could and would call it. Um, so it's, it, I, I essentially, you could say that I, I'm, I, I, I have, the beliefs of uh, 60s, 70s, new left counterculture. Um, but I have the tactics more of a uh, voluntarist, um, libertarian, uh, sovereign citizen kind of thing. So it, it's, it's kind of... Um, I came to libertarianism for very utilitarian reasons uh, for because I felt like these are the best tools to achieve 
the P. Um, the queer thing came later, um, mostly because I just I didn't understand it uh-huh. um, for a long time. Um, it was always there. It was always a motivation. The fact that I was different, that I was profoundly different from everybody I knew. That I kind of grew up feeling like a space alien. And, you know, f- trying to find ways to exist in society as somebody that is that profoundly different, even when you don't know what that difference is, that was a huge motivator for, for my, my politics. Um, I didn't understand what I was until I was well in my 20s. Uh-huh. I just didn't have, I didn't have the, uh, the vocabulary for it. Growing up in um, rural 90s Pennsylvania, I barely knew what transgender was. And I nobody had ever heard of anything like gender queer or non-binary. So right. The idea of what it meant to be transgender was very finite. You know, it, what you, it was basically what you heard on Oprah. It was always the same story. I knew from day one that it was a girl. I played with dolls, wore dresses, black boys. None of that stuff added up for me. Um, Growing up, I liked pro wrestling and heavy metal music. Um, I wasn't allowed to be a girl because I was not typically feminine and uh, because i was attracted to girls so it, to me transgender that never showed up on on the board because my understanding of what it meant to be transgender meant being the most extreme example of what femininity is and that just never been the case with me. and it took me a long time to realize that I'd essentially been a tomboy in a boy's body uh, which is, I mean, it sounds simple, but the subtleness and the differences is part of what made it so complicated. I like the things the other boys like, but I wasn't one of them. I didn't feel like I was one of them. Mm-hmm. I, I couldn't shake that. Um, it's a very kind of hard thing to put together. Um, and it took me a, a long time to do it. Um, once I realized that I was a queer person, that this was my tribe, it was something that I had been looking for my entire life. And it kind of made all the other pieces of my life make sense. Hmm. It all felt very random, like a very random collage of events until I realized that, you know, and my gender identity is not easy to explain because um, it's it, it fluctuates to some degree. Uh, it, generally speaking, it, it, it's it, I exist on the female end of the spectrum, but it kind of fluctuates from androgyny to female. Um, and I would say about eighty percent of the time, I basically feel lesbian hmm. but getting other people to see that to, to see you um that's kind of the hardest part um because it's not like i can just put on a, a flannel shirt or doc martens and people just fucking get it you know right and like it came from indigo girls concert you know I, I have to get people to see that I am not male. And in order to do that, it takes a degree of theater. Um, I have to, uh, I have to kind of accentuate a few feminine, the feminine things about me that do not feel completely fake. I, I, I try not to, um, uh, I try not to push it too hard because I don't, I don't want to feel like, you know, it felt like I was playing a part for most of my childhood. I didn't, I don't want to 
you know, go from playing one part to playing another. So I, I, there needs to be a degree of authenticity, but at the same time, I have to get through to people that, you know, at the very least that I'm not male. Um, and in order to do that, uh, I, I kind of have to be a bit provocative. Um, that's what gender fuck means. It, it's essentially uh, take people's understanding of what gender means and to kind of flip it over. Um, so it's 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 it's, it, it, it's tactical. Um, it's kind of my my uh, my gender queerness is kind of like my uh, libertarianism. It's very tactical. It's a tactical way to get people to see me uh, and to see that I'm not one of them, which is kind of weird because, you know, I mean, on one hand, you don't want to be seen, but not being seen is just a, it's a horrible existence. It, it slowly grinds away. Um, sure. I mean, it nearly destroyed me. It, I, I became agoraphobic. I stopped leaving the house. I, I attempted to erase myself. Um, but it, it, you can't live like that. Um, so I, I kind of came to the conclusion that, you know, if I have to be the villain to exist, then I'll play that part. If I have to be outrageous, if I have to set things on fire to exist, then that's, that's how I'm going to exist. But I'm going to exist. People are going to see me whether they want to see me or not. Uh, so, I'm confrontational. But it's largely a survival survival mechanism. Not that I don't enjoy it from time to time. <laughs> it definitely plays into my personality, or maybe my personality plays into into it. You know, chicken in the egg. Who knows? Well, so how has I mean, I I would imagine that the kind of the rise in identity politics or this whole. Uh, concept about being gender binary that's it's kind of gone mainstream I guess in the last five years or so do you think that that's helped you out what are your feelings about that just the fact that you are you more comfortable being able to be yourself or has it become too almost mainstream in some ways I mean what what yeah I have let's go from there extremely conflicted feelings about it um mm -hmm. it's good for the kids um, because if I, I mean, I, it would have, it would have saved me a lot of pain if I would have had some frame of reference, I would have had some idea that I had options, you know, that this thing, this body wasn't a prison cell. Um, on the other hand, the mainstream is the problem, um, you know, I, uh, America is the problem. Uh, I don't see us changing America. I see America changing us. Yeah. And generally speaking, when tyrannical governments fail to subjugate, they assimilate. Um, they appropriate. They, right. And what you get is a very kind of milk toast, safe version of the culture and and. That's essentially what they've tried to do is they've largely, they failed to kind of destroy us. So they kind of use queer people and their tolerance of us as proof that they're not so bad. That right. They're um, humanitarian. And, um, that we're, we're kind of like pets to them. They can kind of parade us around, and it proves how tolerant they are. Uh, you know, so the next time they bomb a family in Pakistan, they can throw a rainbow flag of bombs. 
I don't see that as beneficial to my people or theirs. Um, and then there's also the fact that, you know, bombs do not know gender or sexuality. There are people that die in every war, whether they're in the closet or not. Um, so allowing my culture to be appropriated by the enemy, by the people who have inspired me, inspired my anger for my entire life is extremely painful to me. To see people like Joe Biden talk about how much he cares about transgender rights uh, when he helped to create the police state that crushes us every single day. I mean, right. Paula Harris presents herself as being an ally. As attorney general in California, she threw trans women in the men's prisons and denied them medical treatment. She became an ally when it was convenient to her political cause. When it was time to run for president, all of a sudden she she was all about us. I'm not buying it. I don't it's it's a costume. And I I don't appreciate it. I mean, it, it's it I honestly find it to be offensive. Um and I don't want my culture to become a part of their culture. Um both because it diminishes our identity and our individuality, and also because it makes us complicit in in a culture that we have nothing to do with. You right. know, and imperialism is a part of this same kind of puritanical culture that inspired people to to burn us at the stake. Um, I can't separate those things. I can't separate that history. Um, so it's on one hand, I'm glad that people have more information. On the other hand, I, you know, I, I, I kind of fought my whole life to kind of find where I belonged. And when I finally find this tribe, they're being bought out by Disney, you know, it's, yeah. kind, of heart, it's kind of heartbreaking, you know, it's, 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 you know, I, I don't really identify with, you know, I guess what you would call the look, LGBT culture. People like, um, I don't see myself in Pete Buttigieg. I don't see myself in people like, um, oh, God. What's her name? The Kardashian clan. Uh, I always forget something like this. Um, She's like the most well-known trans person on the planet. And that just even more in love. I, I, I don't, I don't, I don't see myself in these uh, these people who are supposed to be our heroes. Um, I see myself in John Waters films. You know, I see myself in the crowd of. Uh, punk rock shows. Um, I, I see myself as being an outsider and I don't, I don't really, the, the current LGBT culture does not feel particularly familiar. To me. Yeah. Um, what's being put out there as being a part of our culture. It's, it's, it's kind of, um, a stale cartoon it's, it's it's their own appropriated version of it and the people who are accepted as being a part of this who are pushed to the position of leadership in this movement are the people who are the most straight who are the most 
binary, the most hetero, um, who fit their idea of what it should mean to be. They don't even like to use the word queer. They prefer LGBT, which is just, it's branding. Um, it, it goes down easier. Um, they can sell it. And I don't want to be sold. Um, yeah. I don't want to be part of their society. I don't want to be normal. Normal uh, was an act of violence to me growing up. You know, normal was uh, a reason to hate myself. I don't want to be normal. Uh, so my my general reaction to that is fuck you. <laughs> and I, there are other people like me. Um, fortunately, there's not enough. Yeah. Because people, um, people are scared, you know, I mean, people, it's still dangerous. It's still dangerous to be queer. Um, sure. You know, I mean, being a trans person, no matter how many corporations, um, officially make us a part of their PR campaign, we still get murdered like fucking crazy. Uh, we still get thrown in men's prisons. We, we've seen, you know, these wave of laws uh, across the country blocking queer children from health care, from access to bathrooms, to just basic human rights. So they kind of, both sides kind of have us where they want us. Um, you know, you have the one side who who demonizes us and then the other side who kind of acts as our protector and we're willing to put up with more of their shit because we're afraid of the other side um i think that's really tragic um, yeah. to be honest with you i find hillbilly culture to be a lot more interesting than suburban white culture right i mean because essentially those people are saying the same thing that i'm saying they're saying that you know we've seen what you're selling and no thanks go fuck yourself and i identify with that and i think it's just it's really sad that we have to hate each other Oh, you know, it's 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 sad to me that when somebody, you know, when a redneck sees me, they see me as being some kind of a child molester. Um, especially, you know, when I was emotionally brutalized as a child. Sure. Church. Um, that's the last thing I want is to push anything on a, on a child. And it, whether it's my identity or somebody else's. Um, right. All I want is for people to let their kids decide for themselves to kind of just respect that they're human beings. And that doesn't mean that they have to be Democrats. That doesn't mean that they have to uh, be people. Your gay son can be a hillbilly to yeah, <laughs> you know, uh, you can you can be um, you can be a queer person with a pickup truck and a southern flag in the back window. You know, uh, is is many mixed feelings as that may give me. Um, that's you know, you can you can you can be both. You know, you can be a queer conservative. You can be you can be a gay populist, you know. I'm Justin Romando um, of antiwar.com. First became he kind of first became um, something of a, a a cult icon because he was an openly gay man who supported Pat Buchanan, right? Um, you know, and he uh, he had very conservative values but that didn't make him any less gay he was still one of us even when he didn't want to be he was still one of us you know? yeah so it's they divide the they divide the best people against each other 
they divide, you know, the they divide the ghetto against the trailer park. Right. They, they divide the artist against the construction worker. And what we're doing is the same thing. We're trying to build something. And it's, and really, I mean, what it, what it all comes down to is that power only exists by illusion. Uh, by definition, power is the rule of the minority over the majority. That is, there is nothing logical about that. That this group of 12 guys in a house run the neighborhood when there are 80 of us and half of us have guns. It doesn't make any fucking sense. Right. Unless they can pin us against each other. That's the only way they can maintain power is the most terrifying thing for the government is that we realize, oh shit, we out, we outnumber them. <laughs> Prison is ours. It, 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 you know, it, they're only as powerful as we allow them to be. Especially in America, where people are armed to the teeth. You know, there's people. It's 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 like seeing people in a prison cell with a machine gun and uh, asking for their rights. And I'm like, you have an M60, you know, and then you know, I try to explain this to people and, and, and it's like, OK, so I shoot the Mexican then to get my. No, the guard. Yeah. Shoot the fucking guard. <laughs> God damn it. And it's, it gets really it's, it's really frustrating to try to explain this to people. Um, they're, they're just so busy. They're so and I mean, what what kind of happens is there's kind of they've kind of created this culture of hatred between us that that you know right existed just for generations, and so there's all this these skeletons that we drag behind us, and it's it's you know it's very understandable you know if you're a queer person who um, spent their childhood getting their ass kicked by. Right kids and John Deere hats, you know, and there's, you know, if you're, 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 you know, especially if you're, you're a, a, a black person who's, you know, they've been lynched by people who look like that, you know, um, there's a long history and there's a lot of shit that goes with it. And it's legitimate, you know, there's, there's a lot of legitimacy to, to political correctness, you know, a lot of there's a lot of legitimacy to things like critical race theory. Yeah, um, but it's a it's kind of it's kind of about um, where do you put your priorities? Um, all of those things oriented with social justice and equality, all of them matter, um, but nothing is going to change as long as the people who put it in place are in power and they will remain in power as long as we remain divided. I mean, that was race was essentially invented for that purpose. You know, after Bacon's rebellion, when, you know, a bunch of black and European people burned Jamestown to the yeah. ground. We were working together because we both yeah. had realized there was a common enemy. Yeah. And they came, they came to the conclusion that, oh, oh shit. Um, you know, we've created a situation that we cannot maintain. There are too many poor people and we are in an environment where we cannot control them with the same kind of traditions that we have in Europe. So we have to create new ones. So they kind of, you know, I mean, there were people who played around, fucked around with notions of black and white going way back, but it wasn't really put into law until, you know, the early 1700s, you know, after some of these rebellions occurred. And, and that's when black became a permanent slave class. Mm -hmm. Poor European people were deemed white and given what amounted at the time to pretty petty privileges. So that they could identify with, with the elites, with the people who step on them. Um, and, 
you know, you give you give somebody who's starving, you give them a piece of bread, and they will kill anybody else over that piece of bread. So it's very it's very easy to turn poor people into bigots. Um, sure. So and, and I mean, you see that you see that repeat itself a lot. You know, a lot of the people who, you know, the people who run. A lot of these, you know, far right wing skinhead groups, they're mostly rich people, but the kids they prey on, they're, they're poor kids, you know, they're kids that are lost. They're kids that, you know, that don't have parents that don't have, that don't have any, any place, any identity. And they give them something to identify with. Um, and they use it to get what they want out of them to prey on them and i the the government does the same thing only the government does it with both sides you know they, they they give minorities like me something to hold on to these rights which are very they're not set in stone. I mean, the recent, the, what's happened with Roe v. Wade really kind of proves that. Mm-hmm. that they can be taken away just as easily as they're given. Um, they're really privileges. Um, they give us these privileges, of uh, these rights that will protect you from the other side. And they're, they're essentially telling the other side the same thing. Um, it's a little more ridiculous on that side because y- y- you know, I mean, you're you're telling you're telling um, white people that they're going to be erased by by a minority. You know, it, 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 it's a, a little bit harder to um, a little bit harder for me to be sympathetic to, towards that point of view. Sure. At, at the same time, they believe it. They have them believing it. They, the, you know, they have poor white people believing that the threat to their existence is brown people coming over the border. Um, it may be bullshit, but they believe that bullshit, and that bullshit is being sold to them by the same side, by the same people who are telling us that uh, we need them to exist. And that's basically what it all comes down to is, is, is it's keeping everybody kind of hoodwinked into believing that we need government, that we need the state to exist. Yeah, we, to protect us from the other. Yeah, to protect us from each other, basically. Yeah. To protect us from ourselves. Uh, and it's breaking down that illusion. It's not easy because it comes with a lot of baggage. Um, I, I get in fights with everybody, with people on the right, with people on the left. On any given day, I get called a fascist and a communist <laughs> right. on the same fucking day. And it's like, and I and usually when the person who's calling me one of these names is somebody I'm trying to help. You know, I'm trying to get you to realize that, you know, the, the, the enemy the, is not the left or the right, the black or the white. It's the people on top. And a lot of people realize that. They instinctively, they realize that, you know, you, I, ask, you ask somebody in, uh, in a redneck bar or a gay bar what they think of the government and, and they'll basically t- they'll give you the same answer. Yeah. They don't trust any. I think it's amazing how many people I think implicitly understand that there's this wealthy class that dominates over all of us. And yet in, in the everyday political conversation, that's not the focus because I think you're exactly right that we've been trained to think about all of these different groups and, and these others that we have to combat that we're, we're focused on, on you know that group over there or that group over there we're all part of this lower class 
you know, there's this lower caste. I don't mind. I, I see it as a caste system. It's so, it's so outrageous to me. And, and again, like everybody knows it, I think, but they just don't, I guess it's, it's because the, the upper classes do such a good job with this divide and conquer technique. Well, yeah. It, and they keep changing the tactics too. The newest tactic is um, that the rich people are really on their side. So um, the rich people are really on the queer people's side. Right. The rich people are really on the hillbilly side, Um, which I mean, to a degree, yeah, we're all being used by them. We're all being used as pawns by them. Um, But the idea that, that, um, that somehow this other group, on the bottom is is part of that elite um, is just absolutely ridiculous right you know i mean you take a look at where people live you know you take a look you know the 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 your average and there's a lot of there's a lot of contention over this the the trump voters that i know at least in you know the Rust Belt. Your average, your average Trump voter, you know, lives in a, a double wide. Yeah. You know, and I mean, that's not. They they may have certain privileges, but that's not overall. I would not identify that person as being privileged. That that's not the first identifier that I would use for that person. Right. That's another poor person. Even if they're straight, even if they think that I'm a, I'm, you know, a trend, you know, that's still not, that's still another poor person. That's that's another possible ally. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I've been amazed at at the hatred for Trump supporters that has been fomented, and I actually think that this is because. I feel like they stood Trump up as a populist leader so that they could tear him down as some kind of a Nazi fascist or Trump supporters as a Nazi fascist because they fear this concept of populism, you know, and I think that the definition of populism is basically those who recognize that this elite or the upper class is the issue. And that should be what politics is about is trying to expose, you know, what the upper classes are doing and trying to unite everybody else because we have the political power if we can unite um but by you know putting trump up there as this right-wing populist and equating it with nazism and fascism and white supremacy and all of this other stuff i totally agree with you the trump supporters that i know most of them are just republicans they're not that different yeah. they're not different than they were five or ten years ago just because trump showed up uh my mom's not a hard work my mom's a hardcore Trump supporter and she, yeah. the biggest trans ally you'll ever find. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's kind of funny because she doesn't fully see it. Um, but like, she'll watch Tucker Carlson and only get pissed off at the end of trans stuff. Right. She'll like come to me. Did you know Tucker Carlson is a bigot? <laughs> no, <laughs> really? <laughs> but uh, it's I don't know, where will I say it? um but at the same time you know that she she's not or she's not a racist she's not she's not a, not a bigot she's she more than anything she's she's mad and she she didn't even start supporting trump until everybody began dumping on trump yeah um, and I, the way I see the whole Trump phenomenon, I, I see this, that it was kind of a mistake, um, that you had this guy, I still suspect in before Justin Raimondo became a Trump supporter, which was very, very hard for me, <laughs> uh, he had this theory very early on, which I still find very interesting. I, I have no proof. But his theory early on was that uh, Trump only decided to run it. He, he had threatened the run like multiple times for, for years. He only pulled the trigger because somebody in the Clinton camp promised him something. Uh, 
basically the idea was that, you know, Trump would destroy the Republican Party. Yeah. And that what would be left over the that, you know, the Clintons can only win. Hillary Clinton can only win when she completely screws everybody else over. Um, but she always underestimates how much people despise her. Uh, so whether or not that was what got Trump started, I think Trump got into it not thinking that he was going to win, that he would he would make a buck off of it, um, that he would, you know, that he would stoke stoke a few a few fears yeah uh, and use it to get another tv show or something sure um, and in the beginning the media loved it um because the media loved hillary and they saw trump as being her ticket to the white house um, that and Trump was a carnival barker, you know, I mean, he was, he was ratings gold. Exactly. When the news was doing horribly. Um, so they covered Trump constantly. It's like every single stop. I honestly do not think Trump would have been nearly as successful if it wasn't for the on the clock coverage that he was given by CNN and NBC. Yeah. Um, and their coverage was at first, this guy's a joke. He's ridiculous. Uh, when it became clear that people were actually voting for him, he might have a chance to win. Then it became this guy is a threat to democracy as we know. It. Um, and I, I don't think that Trump ever intended to win. I don't think he believed that he was. Oh, I don't think he expected to win either. I almost wonder, I don't trust the voting system, you know, the, the electronic voting machines. And I wonder if they didn't rig it for Trump at the time just to have this figure that they could tear down, that they could, that they could put up there and then make the populist perspective appear to be this racist, fascist. I, I mean, I'm not, you know, I almost became an accidental Trump supporter myself and I, and I won't, I still won't call myself a Trump supporter, but um, going back to what we were talking about earlier with the Iraq war, like to me, Bush and Cheney still stand out as by far the most evil uh, in terms of what they did in, in the Middle East and what the foreign policy was. And they're, I mean, blatant imperialists talking about American exceptionalism, unbelievable. So, you know, I'm not like Trump to me was an improvement over that. <laughs> at we, also least. Have, we also have a fairly decent amount of evidence that they stole the election twice. Yeah. Well, absolutely. Um, you know, in Ohio and Florida. Yeah. Uh, so the idea that, um, that, that Trump is, is the enemy of democracy. Right. Uh, which really, I see Trump as being a sign of the decline of Western civilization and neoliberalism. Uh, Trump, Trump is more of a symptom than anything else. Um, not somebody who is in control. Well, you know, I think it is that there are just so many poor white people out there that are now feeling so alienated from the system. And then with the rise of identity politics, I think that there was, I mean, there was bound to be a backlash from the dominant culture when identity politics became a thing. And I don't, I thought from the very beginning, actually, and I, I just, I actually agree so much with what you were saying about that. My perception of it as a white male, it's kind of difficult for me. I can have my opinions about it. I have, I'm not a part of the oppressed class, although or I'm not a part of the, you know, one of the, the groups that identify as oppressed. Um, but I can understand actually the frustration on, I felt the frustration because I don't feel super privileged. I mean, I don't, you know, right. Yeah. Like we live in a world where all of us are pretty oppressed, um, fairly, uh, fairly equally. Some are more oppressed than others, but I don't see the reason why we need to be arguing about who's the most oppressed when we should yeah. be, you know, that, talking that about like, an, like how do we that get seems like an argument to have after the revolution? Exactly. <laughs> um, 
but yeah, it's in the, the majority of people who I know in Pennsylvania who voted for Trump, you would ask most of them and they would they would admit right away that he's an asshole. That they don't agree with him on, on you know, even 70 percent of the shit. Yeah. But it was essentially it was a referendum on NAFTA for uh, Clinton's had sold all their jobs overseas. And they saw Trump as basically being this human brick to throw through the White House window. Yeah. And the fact that he freaked everybody out in the establishment was precisely why they voted for him. And that's why the more those people hate him, the more the more his supporters love him. Yeah. Uh, because they they they're they're they they're turning him into you know this this kind of this kind of victim um when in reality trump is you know he's a, he's a dime store slime ball you know he he wouldn't be caught dead eating in the same dining room with most of his own mothers. you know he he's a guy who went to parties with bill clinton and jeffrey epstein yeah He's part of that elite. He's 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 not one of the parts of the elite that they would choose as a representative of the elite. He's kind of, um, you know, he's the drunk guy at the party. You know? Right. <laughs> They're kind of embarrassed that he's there, but he's still going to buy the buy the next keg. So you know, but but he he's. He is basically one of them, um, but he he's kind of been kind of turned into this boogeyman. Uh, well, that was the thing that I thought was unfair, just that I don't I mean, he's not he Trump supporters, the Republican Party. I mean, they're not politically correct. They certainly could be more tolerant in their personal lives. Um, but I think that the way it got blown, I don't know, something about the conversation has just really taken, taken, taken it to where it's, it's, it's become so extremely divisive. I mean, all the talk about, you know, gender identity, but, uh, racial identity, um, it's just, it, you, you know, there, there's, it's, it feels like people should be able to have some logical conversations. We, sh we can all do some maturing and some adulting and becoming a little bit more uh, tolerant in our own perspectives. Yeah. But, you know, the people that are like the Trump supporters, I just don't, you know, the, the way that they got painted as, as Nazis and white supremacists and these like radical conservative fascists, I didn't. That's not what's really happening here. I mean, yeah, what I mean there I, was a there was a few of them in there, right? Uh, but there's always a few of them. Yeah, <laughs> I mean, you, you know, you'll, you'll find a you'll find a few assholes in in, in a crowd crowds big enough. Yeah, um, but yeah, I mean, the ones who I know personally, that does not describe them. Um, yeah, doesn't I, mean that, that doesn't mean that they're like that they're saints either sure most of the trump supporters i know um have some pretty fucked up opinions at the same time i'm not gonna let that stop me from having a conversation with them right and i think that's part of the problem is that there's no room for conversation there's no room to, to disagree exactly you know, and it's to me, you know, it's 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 hurtful that people see my gender identity as an ideology. But if that's the way you want to view it, as long as you respect my right to it, I can live with that. Yeah. Well, that's that. that's the other thing that I find is that a lot of these people, I mean, they may be conservative you know, I mean, you're raised conservative Christian or whatever. That's just your, those are your people and that's your tribe. And they tend to be a lot, they're a lot more live and let live than people give them credit for. And yeah. it's, it's easy to foment um, a lot of this disagreement. I mean, they're not going to, you know, they're not going to start hanging out in gay bars, um, but they're not the devil either. And that, I think we just need to start like, 
raising the level of tolerance in our society at the same time coming to the recognition that we're all we're kind of we're really all in the same boat together yeah um there's something i you know when i read the first essay that i think that your most recent essay that the don't say gov about how gay kids need anarchy um what queer kids need need now is anarchy yeah (laughs) and i i just um it it struck me while I was reading that because there's a certain, I mean, we're talking about communities and tribes here and you were talking about how like we need to blow up the the public schools and we, we need to educate our own, you know, we need to have our own systems for the queer community or who, you know, whatever community it could be educating their own kids in their own way. And then it sounds segregationist on one level, but on another level, it's like people do need to find their tribes and hang out in their groups. And that's okay. You know, we're not trying to, it's not, I don't want to live in a society where we're all assimilated into, you know, one sort of tan skinned culture or something like there's, we, we want to live in a world where there's all kinds of different communities and different groups. And but there's always going to be a little bit of tension between different groups. It doesn't mean we have to start, you know, lynching each other. Mm -hmm. Um, But I just, I feel like a lot of the tension that's happened in the last five years or so has been really exaggerated. Like it's a natural tension that is born of different people living different lifestyles and finding their tribe that they're hanging out with. And that's great. I mean, that's, that's real diversity. And then sure. We need to teach, tolerance of each of the different groups um but this idea of assimilating all the groups together um as being sort of one happy family i think that actually that's an assimilation into like a a real homogenous system so the melting pot just doesn't right it doesn't really work the the reality is that whoever is the dominant group is the one who dictates what people melt into yeah exactly the people who run the school system are by and large um straight white males so they're the best you're gonna get from them is assimilation yeah Um, because they don't they don't understand what it's like to be cool or they can't and they can't understand what it's like to to be to be law. They can't possibly understand that. Right. Um, and for them to be in charge of what it means to be, you know, a black man in American society, that that is inherently that is colonialist. And that was the point. That was the the point of the school system was to colonize people. I mean the, the in the beginning, it was literally set up to teach the King James Bible. Uh, and over the years, it's been used to Americanize people. Yeah. To whichever, it was largely used on, on, on immigrants uh, to make sure that they were American enough to be a part of this. Uh, and that basically meant erasing what it meant to be whatever they were before yeah making them more pliable towards this very kind of materialist top-down society making them compliant workers and that's kind of what what the school system has become is 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 uh, it's teaching kids how to be compliant cogs in this machine right wow well, I mean, that's just, you know, when I think about the public school system, talking about the dominant group, I mean, who are the people that are building that system? And it's the upper class. I mean, it's yeah. the rich, it's the rich upper class. And they are, they, they happen to tend to be uh, white males of European descent. That's where, that's the the dominant colonizing force yeah. came from Europe. Um but, you know, I feel like, too, that it is applied equally across all spectrums. I mean, white, the, the you know, average white person gets sucked it's, into that system, too, it's right? Universal, it's universally oppressive. Uh, and it's, yeah. it, 
the bigotry, one of the biggest forms of bigotry in this country, um, and I'm very passionate about this, is, is bigotry against children. They're not treated as citizens in this country. They don't have rights. They're property. Yeah. Um, and I that that's regardless of race, gender, whatever. Uh, I, every 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 single student in the compulsory school system is a victim of this. It's it's a form of child abuse. Yeah. Um, and for for some people, it may be more abusive than it is for others. But it, but everybody is being coerced. You know, it's interesting because I was as I was reading that essay that you wrote. You know, clearly having a uh, a bad relationship or but you know being in a bad situation in high school and having to deal with what you had to deal with. You know, I had actually a similar experience, and I'm a straight white guy. Yeah. Uh, I just hated it. <laughs> I mean, yeah. it was yeah. because I felt how oppressive it was. And I, this, I went to high school in Texas and there were, you know, I was a nerdy kid who liked to read history books and it, there were all the jocks and, you know, football players were the big thing. And that was the whole social scene was, was built around that. And it pissed the hell out of me. Um, the, number one, I, the number, the number one target of the, I'm sorry to interrupt, but yeah, go ahead the number one target of the system is the individual. Yeah. And that the, and that's actually the reason why uh, minorities are targeted is because by nature, we are individual. Uh, we're, we're, we, we are not like the majority. Sure. And that makes us dangerous. Um, and uh, that makes us, you know, we run the risk of setting a bad example uh, for the rest of, for the rest of you people. <laughs> um, they, people freak the fuck out when white kids started going to Chuck Berry shows. Yeah. The white kids are dancing like black kids now. And I mean, that's not because they were afraid that their kids were going to be black. They were afraid that their, their kids were going to be free, you know? That's 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 what rock and roll is all about. That's what punk rock is about. That's what being queer was about. And to me, I mean, if I can teach straight people to be a little more queer, <laughs> I mean, in, in their own way, yeah. Then I think I, I I think I'm doing the right thing. Yeah. I think Harvey Milk would be proud. Right. If you are listening to this, you are listening to the first free hour of The Shift with Doug McKinty. For access to the full feature-length versions of the podcast, go to www.theshiftnow.com and subscribe for the audio version for just $6 a month. Access the full-length episodes in video form through rockfin.com by subscribing at the Shift with Doug McKinty landing page. For $9.99 a month, you gain access not only to The Shift, but also all other premium content material hosted on the platform. Find out more at www.theshiftnow.com backslash store. Detoxify your body, decolonize your mind, make the shift. Yeah, I mean, I wish we could come up with some kind of solution, but I don't know. It is really challenging. I mean, I think about, um, you know, I think about people like yourself and how it, like it actually is dangerous for you to go to go out, to go to certain parts of town or to go into certain communities. That's definitely something I don't really have to worry about. Um, and I don't know how to, you know, how do you end those cycles of fear? Like people shouldn't have to live like that. They shouldn't have to live in a state of fear. They shouldn't have to be dealing with these um like larger forces of violence that are out of our control, I guess, because that's kind of what triggers this cycle of violence that, that never ends. I mean, I don't know how yeah. to, you know, how to we stop that from to, happening. We kind of have to realize that people are people. And yeah. The people aren't, aren't the problem. It's, it's the systems themselves. And that's kind of what I learned, um, you know, to go full circle as a child, most of the adults in my life were not actually trying to hurt me. It was the system itself. Yeah. 
that kind of taught me to hurt myself. And you kind of have to convince people to reject these systems um, and to realize that there's more common ground between, between us uh, than there is between these systems that, that we become reliant on. Um, that ultimately, at the end of the day, if your if your car is in a ditch tomorrow, it's not the government that's going to pull you out. It's 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 Jeffro from down the street, right? Whether he's got a southern flag on his truck or not, you know, yeah, that's as close of a solution as I can come to. Yeah, is that you know we we have to kind of try to find the humanity in each other. We kind of have to realize that at the end of the day in spite of all our differences uh, that people are people that everybody essentially wants the same thing yeah, I mean that's kind of what I see in this in the debate over the over the the, the queer issue when I get into arguments with people on the right about it um, they 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 say that you know we're we're trying to protect our children and I, I I try to tell them that's what we're trying to do too. Yeah, we're trying to protect our kids. Um, that our instincts are are, are the same, um, whether they're misplaced or not. So I mean, you have to find some kind of common ground. And you have to try to work on that. And it's, it's something that you do every day. It's a process. You're trying to get people to, to see that you're human and to see that they're human too. Well, that sounds like a plan. I mean, I'm 100% with you. If people are people and that's, that's the good and the bad. And there's always going to be assholes out there. You know, we can't get rid of that. Um, But we can get rid of these systems of power that have institutionalized this kind of behavior. Um, So I think that's a real important distinction to make. Like on a personal level, most people are actually trying to do the same thing. Um, You know, sometimes their their values are misplaced. Um, Sometimes they turn out to be assholes. But, you know, we're all people trying to make it through. Um, But I think it's, you know, we've got to make a distinction between that everyday experience, which sometimes includes bigotry and bullshit and assholes and, you know, and then and then this systemic imperialism that is, you know, really wiping out the planet. I mean, people need to, you know, somehow. I think if we could eliminate the systems and then focus on the individuals, then you get an opportunity to start that, to break that cycle of violence, you know, person by person, start that healing process, increase the level of tolerance, you know? Yeah. Um, But yeah, it's got to start somewhere. Well, Nikki, I think I've probably kept you long enough. It's been it's been an hour over an hour and a half now. Um, I really appreciate you coming on though, and appreciate your words and your perspective on all of this. Um, and I've really been uh, very happy to get to know your work over over the last week as I've been checking it out. So, if you've got any uh, if you've got anything else that you want to say before we call it and uh, let people know maybe where they can find your work. Uh, yeah, my blog is uh, Exile in Happy Valley. Um, I'm I don't know when this when this is going to come out. It'll be out ne- by next week for sure, if not in the next couple of days. So, well, I won't know whether or not I'm going to be in Counterpunch that week, but I'm usually most 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 weeks I, I'm on Counterpunch on the weekend. You can find me. In. Okay. 
and you can find me on attack the system as well. All right. Sounds good. And uh, I'll make sure to put those links in the show notes. So um, definitely recommend to my audience that they check it out. It's a, it's a really unique perspective that you've got. And again, like, I feel like where, you know, I guess my kind of right libertarianism kind of meets that left, that left populism, I guess. Um, I feel like, um, even though, you know, I kind of come from this more traditional background, uh, we really are on the same page with almost everything that, that, uh, you know, I've read of yours. And so I hope more and more people can kind of get, get on, get on that page where we all need to get together and we all need to fight uh, the systemic violence before we can even really start to address the personal violence. Um, yeah break the larger cycles and then start to work on, I mean, you know, of course we can always work on our individual, uh, our individual perspectives, but, um, but it's not going to end until these, you know, the, this, this larger system of imperialism really gets addressed. So, and I, and I think um, if people check out your stuff, they'll find that that's what you're addressing. You're really able to point out, you know, here's this larger system uh, that we're all being oppressed by. And if we all figure it out, we can do something about it. So, <laughs> yeah. all right. Um, I'll let people know that they've been listening to The Shift and I've been your host, Doug McKinty. You can find my stuff at www.theshiftnow.com. Uh, and I've also been writing on Substack. My blog is called The Populist Papers. So thepopulistpapers.substack.com. You can find my written stuff there. All right, Nikki, thanks a lot for coming on. I really appreciate it. And uh, we'll yeah. keep in touch. Thank you. Yep. Take care. And there you have it, ladies and gentlemen. That was my conversation with blogger and journalist Nikki Reed. I discovered Nikki on Facebook, actually. Somehow she became a Facebook friend of mine. And I just started reading through her posts as they would come up on my feed. And I was always um, basically astonished. At first of all, what a great writer she is. Uh, she has a great sense of humor and she has a great way of, of being very direct in her writing. Um, but uh, secondly, her what I would describe as a left populist perspective, um, and I've been more and more identifying as, I guess you would call it right populist. It almost depends on, on how you grew up. You know, I can't come from this libertarian place. Uh, and so as I've evolved, I end up, calling myself, I guess, a right populist. Um, but Nikki had just the opposite experience. She came from a, a Marxist perspective as a, as a young woman. She was a tanky, a commie, uh, attracted to the Latin American communist movements, anti-imperialistic, uh, and then discovered, uh, as you just heard, voluntarism, libertarian concepts that she just ultimately realized I had an ethos, had an ethic, a morality behind them uh, that just make too much sense. So she she made a blending of the two, um, and and has really developed this uh, this this brand of left populism that I loved. I discovered that I just agreed with everything she was saying in her posts, and so I looked into her work uh, a little bit deeper, checked out her blog. Um, and was just really excited to find someone, again, that was more coming from this left-wing point of view that could continue, as, as you all know, I love to do on this show, to bridge the left-right divide. Um, and, of course, her transgender identity was a conversation I've been wanting to have. Uh, identity politics is just all over the news these days. Everybody's wanting to talk about it and figure out um, where we go from here, <laughs> suddenly it's, uh, it's all over the news, right? And so I wanted to have a real conversation with a person that actually uh, lived the lifestyle and had the experience from the other point of view. I, of course, being a straight white male, um, typically would be considered the oppressor uh, by, by the philosophy of identity politics. And I've seen over the last few years just the whole thing become so amazingly divisive as I believe, and I think Nikki would agree, that the upper classes really love to do. They, they promote these philosophies that divide, uh, and they get us to fight amongst ourselves, and we miss the target every time. 
um, instead of unifying, as we all should, against the upper classes, against a lot of, of these uh, manipulative tactics, against the takeover of any kind of a democratic or representative form of government by people with big money, um, we're fed these political philosophies that are designed to put each other down, and we're constantly arguing back and forth, and I'm just so tired of it. Uh, so I was really happy when Nikki agreed to do this show. She hasn't done too many podcasts in the past, um, but I got her to come on, and we could have that conversation. You know, what is it like for you to be transgender? How do you feel about uh, this identity politics movement? How is it affecting your community? Uh, and I definitely appreciate that perspective. It reminded me a lot of my conversation with Nico House a few months back, maybe six months ago now, uh, who's an Af African-American journalist. And we were discussing identity politics in the same light. Like, is this really helping your community? Um, and the answer, I think, is no. I mean, it's frustrating for both Nico and now Nikki to see their communities being kind of used and abused by oftentimes upper middle class white liberal people to engage in this inauthentic form of virtue signaling. Um, I thought it was really cool that the thing that attracted Nikki ultimately to a, a voluntarist libertarian mindset was the ethic behind it, the nonviolent principles, right? <laughs> you know, um, you can't treat other people with aggression. Uh, it just has, it's a simple moral ethos and it really makes sense. And after that, if you accept that ethos, then, you know, whether you choose to engage in some free market activities or you choose to live in a commune or whatever, we can all still live in the same world together. We don't have to argue about it. Whether you are transgender or whether you're a black person or Hispanic or uh, you know, a white male. We can all live in the same world together in a free society as long as we have these, this ethical foundation. Uh, and um, as Nikki described, the identity politics movement has created a, a bandwagon around her community that uh, she just doesn't really appreciate. It lacks that, that moral foundation, that authenticity. And that's what I'm finding so much of this conflict and it's getting out of control where the identity politics people, if you don't agree with their perspective, then you're automatically a racist or a homophobe or all of these other things. And it's like, you know, some of us just don't feel like identity politics is the path forward, that we need to have a unifying political philosophy that recognizes that the class war is the issue. And you get, you know, you get called a racist. I got called a racist the other day. Uh, for bringing this up on a Facebook post, and the person was then advocating for, you know, hey, as a white man, you're just afraid that you're going to lose corporate power to these other groups. And I said, I said back to him, this is exactly the problem. The, the foundation of it is that corporate power is a good thing, as long as we divide it amongst ourselves equally, instead of going after the corporate system. The corporate system is the problem. And that's what Nikki can see. She sees through it. She sees that that kind of centralization of power is ultimately the problem and that the decentralization of power into the hands of these different communities is the solution. And that's what she wants to see. She wants to see an empowered queer community that's able to protect their own, that's able to educate their own. And just like all of us and all of our different groups can do, the African American community, the Hispanic American community. Um, and so it was her advocacy of decentralization of power that ultimately I think is something that if we could all just agree on this, we can really move forward. You know, we can have a political movement that functions uh, to start to really solve the problems caused exactly by the centralization of power. If you've read uh, some of my recent essays uh, on the populist papers on Substack, uh, I've been talking about just stopping all this argument and agreeing to decentralize power, uh, getting getting outside of the left-right paradigm. And it was great to find this uh, this journalist, Nikki, <clears throat> who is transgender herself, who lives a, a completely different lifestyle than I do. But we can agree on these fundamental principles and the bigger picture, which is to decentralize the mechanisms of power that allow for the, the broader imperialistic structure that's going on to this day. Um, again, I just, when I read her stuff, it's amazing how much I agree. I think when you, when you grab that voluntarist ethos, when you understand the morality behind that, it becomes easier to see the corruption uh, in, the, in the centralization of power. And 
again, some of my complaints about the progressive movement, just like in that Facebook post where he's not seeing that the corporate power is the problem, uh, the centralization of power seems to be a given with progressives. Um, it's not about, it's about everybody having free corporate health care, not health care choice. It's about everybody having free education, the curriculum that the government wants to teach us, not the choice to choose the curriculum that we want for our families, for our loved ones, and for ourselves. Uh, it's just such a huge shift that people have to make. If, you, if you're presuming, making assumptions that the current system of power is great, except that you know we need to we need to allow these disparate minority groups to be included in the power structure i think you're just missing the whole point i mean this was nikki's transition from being a marxist to being a, a left populist a voluntarist because you can you know once you realize that once power is centralized then it's going to get corrupted i mean the only solution the only way out is to decentralize and like we had in our conversation, it's great. Of course, you want these disparate groups to have tolerance for each other, but you also can't force integration. That's assimilation. And you're getting assimilated into what? You're getting assimilated into whoever the current power structure is. I mean, Nikki mentions this in, in the conversation. Um, and so I think it's important to recognize that it's it's okay to, to advocate for a powerful minority communities. Ultimately, this is the diversity that I think we all seek. The progressives say that they believe in diversity, but what they really mean is a diversity of skin tone and sexual identity within the pre-existing corporate power structure. Uh, not, you know, not uh, the diversity that comes from allowing these minority communities to have strength uh, in the power of self-determination for themselves. So again, just really happy to have found uh, Nikki's work and have this conversation with her. I'm hoping to have her on uh, maybe in the future uh, on the new show, Breaking the News, maybe get her in on some round tables because it is important to have perspectives from, from uh, a variety of different um, different minority groups. I mean, we want to invite diversity. We want to have these conversations and guess what? Uh, we can still have respect for each other, even if the lifestyle choices are, are completely different. Um, having good conversation is good conversation, especially when we are aligned in the common goal of decentralizing power. So I hope that's what you got out of this conversation. That's what I got out of it. And I definitely um, am happy to have met Nikki and gotten to know her work. So I hope you do the same, actually. And I will let you know that you can check her blog out at www.exileinhappyvalley.blogspot.com. Um, everything that she does, I think, ultimately gets posted there. So that's the best place to go to find her stuff. And I think you'll find her perspective really unique. And um, it was actually just, um, uh, it was, it was a really, it was really nice to find her because um, so often that typical progressive identity politics kind of left wing perspective comes out of the transgender community and to find a, a real solid left populace that's seeing through the BS and speaking truth to power the way Nikki does uh, was just so refreshing. So I got a lot out of it and I hope you do too. Uh, again, that website is exileinhappyvalley.blogspot.com. You can check her stuff out there. Uh, and as always, uh, you can go find more on The Shift at www.theshiftnow.com. Next week, I am having a conversation about uh, the new WHO treaty uh, expansions that are going to give the World Health Organization yet more power. Apparently, the Biden administration has actually been uh, promoting this. They put forth these new amendments that will allow the World Health Organization to go anywhere in the world. Uh, and start imposing lockdowns and restrictions wherever a new pandemic is spotted. So uh, we'll be discussing uh, concerns about that. So look forward to that one. Uh, and of course, you can find all of my stuff again at www.theshiftnow.com. Uh, and my written work now is posted on Substack at The Populist Paper. So you can check that out there as well. All right. Thanks, everybody, for listening. And we will catch you again next week. Okay. Take care. Mm -hmm.